Okay, we're good on my end whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Allison McKenzie and I am the chair of the Historic Conservation Board. I would like to take a minute to remind everyone about the rules of this proceeding. This proceeding is at all times governed by the rules of procedure adopted by the board on September 26, 2011, amended March 23, 2015, last amended March 9, 2020. A copy of the rules of procedure is available for review online. All those planning to testify today, which does not include those solely making arguments such as attorneys, should stand and take an oath administered by the board's attorney. This is a quasi-judicial hearing. As such, the board reserves the right to deliberate in private. The Ohio Rules of Evidence do not apply to this hearing. However, the professional rules of conduct do apply and candor to the tribunal is required. The board members are citizen volunteers and are not paid for their service. They are treated as public officials under Ohio law. Any attempt to influence them, including but not limited to bribery, intimidation, retaliation, which may include contacting their employer in an attempt to exert influence is, published, is punishable as a crime. All should be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Therefore, please speak clearly into your microphone and state your name and address for the record. In the event of any technical difficulties with the video conferencing technology, I may continue or postpone this hearing at my discretion. All participants providing testimony must have both camera and audio features turned on in order to participate. With that said, let's proceed with the first item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> item one is, <clears throat> excuse me, an application for a certificate of appropriateness and zoning relief for 811 Dayton Street in the Dayton Street Historic District. Uh, this is an application for a new carriage house outbuilding <clears throat> at the rear of the property along the alley. Uh, it does include a living space above the ground floor garage area. <clears throat> so there is zoning relief that is required. Um, there's a numerical variance to allow two principal structures on the lot. Also a dimensional variance of eight feet to allow a height of 23 feet in excess of the 15 foot limit. And finally, a dimensional variance of two feet for a one foot west side yard setback short of the required three feet and a variance of three feet for a zero yards or a zero rear yard setback short of the required three feet. So this application is for the construction of a carriage house. Uh, on the rear of the lot at the location of a former carriage house that was historically on the property that has since been demolished. Um, the applicant is proposing to rebuild in a similar footprint as the original carriage house. Um, you can see on the existing site plan, there is still a retaining wall from the former carriage house at that location. The new carriage house will be slightly deeper than the original, but otherwise will maintain that same footprint as the historic building. Uh, so the staff does feel that this is appropriate in the interest of historic conservation as the rear alley known as Nair Street uh, does contain many other examples of carriage houses in similar configurations. Uh, you can see some of those examples and the materials provided by the applicant here. Many of them are two stories with living space above, uh, ground floor garage space. Um, the staff feels that the proposed composition of the building is appropriate, it's primarily clad in brick. It will have a steel garage door with no window openings at the ground level and three aluminum clad wood windows above and a cornice line at the top. So seeing as this does fit within the general pattern of development along that alley frontage, staff does recommend approval of the numerical variance to allow two principal structures on the lot, approval of the dimensional variance of eight feet to allow a height of 23 feet, and approval of the dimensional variances of two feet for the west side yard setback and three feet for the rear yard setback. Staff also recommends approval of the Certificate of Appropriateness for 811 Dayton Street, including any revisions submitted for permit subject to staff review and approval with the following condition. 
a, the building permits must be issued within two years of the decision date or the COA shall expire. Thank you, Mr. Owen. I do not have a sign-in sheet yet, but I'm assuming we have an owner or applicant. Um, if so, if you would like to add anything to the staff report, uh, please let me know and we'll get you sworn in. Okay, uh, we could swear in Ms. Kendrick. Just one second, just have trouble finding her here. Okay, uh, Ms. Kendrick, could you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear the testimony you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. What would you like to add? Um, I didn't really have much to add. I thought you were just asking if the owner was present and I was raising my hand that I was, and then I was sworn in. So I apologize for the confusion. I just really didn't think that this many people would sign on for my little house. <laughs> the majority of these people, yeah, majority of these people are here for item number two. Um, so, oh, is there anything oh. you'd like to tell the board? No, I'm fine. Thank you. It does look like we also have the architect joining us. Uh, would the architect team like to add anything? No, we have nothing. This is David Kirk. Okay. We have nothing, nothing to add. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, from the board? I do not have anyone from the public signed up for this case. Um, with that being said, I will entertain a motion. Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve both the zoning relief and the certificate of appropriateness. Second. Thank you. I will call the roll. Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Mr. Young? Aye. Mr. Zlasko? Aye. Mr. Voss? Aye. I think I got all the board. Did I miss anyone? <laughs> the chair votes aye. Thank you. Um, your application is approved. Uh, so please feel free to drop off the call if you do not want to stay for item number two. So up next is item number two. And I do have, yeah, I do have just a couple things to handle preliminarily before we dive into this item in detail. Um, first, I wanted to state that the board will not address Kingsley's motion to disqualify as the board does not have jurisdiction to make determinations on attorney disqualification. And this hearing is a quasi legislation le legislative hearing. I can, I can make that out eventually. Um, second, uh, my understanding is that we have parties with ownership interests uh, in the property that would uh, like to present to the board, and we actually have two of those uh, uh, parties, uh, these being Kingsley Investment Group and Christ Temple Full Gospel Baptist Church. Um, due to that, I move to suspend the rules and allow them both the opportunity to present. Do I have a second for that motion? Second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, I all guess right. I can call the, the no, roll. I, Not sure if I need the full full roll, David, or is all I, in favor? I, yeah, let's let's go ahead and do the full roll. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Weiss? Yes. Mr. Sunderman? Aye. Mr. Young? Aye. Mr. Zalasco? Aye. Mr. Voss? Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. Uh, that being said, uh, I think we are ready, Mr. Owen, for the staff presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> this is an application for a landmark uh, status for the Hoffman School Building at 3060 Durrell Avenue. Um, the property is being nominated under Criterion 1 and criterion three for its association with the progressive era and city beautiful movement on school design in Cincinnati and for its Jacobethan revival style architecture. Uh, the staff analysis on this item consists solely of the issue before the board today, specifically whether the property holds historic significance under the relevant criteria. As a bit of background, the progressive era movement under which this is being nominated dates to the turn of the century through the 1920s and focused on ways to alleviate the suffering of the working class. A major part of that 
movement was the belief that the government held responsibility for its citizens' well-being. So the Hoffman School was designed with progressive ideals in mind, including dedicated rooms for a cafeteria, art, music, and physical activity, open air classrooms, and large windows to allow for light and ventilation. Uh, also coinciding with the progressive era, the city beautiful movement focused on introducing beautification and monumental architecture into cities. And the Hoffman School demonstrates these ideals through its monumental Jacobethan style architecture and its location on a rise in the land above Victory Parkway, which in itself was inspired by the City Beautiful movement. Uh, regarding its architecture, the building was designed by the noted architectural firm of Hannaford and Sons. While it was built after Samuel Hannaford's death, the architectural firm itself still holds significance in Cincinnati's history. The Jacobethan revival style architecture is not common in the area and character defining features of this style exhibited by the Hoffman School include a central tower with turrets and battlements, segmental arches, decorative finishes, including ornamental stonework and figurines and original wood and original windows and doors. The building retains exceptional historic integrity with the vast majority of the character defining features remaining intact. So this school was identified in several separate architectural surveys over the years as a building that is eligible for listing. These surveys occurred in 1978, 1998, and most recently in a 2019 National Register questionnaire where the Ohio Historic Preservation Office determined that the building was, in, was eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, it's also of note that the building was also included in the City Council approved 2019 Evanston Neighborhood Work Plan, which includes the goal to build upon Evanston's rich history through the preservation of buildings and also the short-term short action step to explore the landmark, landmark designation for other historic buildings such as the Hoffman School and Calvary United Methodist School. Unfortunately, as the city's historic conservation office has limited staff, we are una unable to proactively nominate buildings and districts ourselves even those that are specifically called out for designation and approved neighborhood plans due to time and workload constraints. So as such, we have to respond to landmark applications that are submitted from other groups and individuals. So with that being said, it is staff's view that the Hoffman School clearly possesses the historic, historic integrity to convey its significance under criteria one and three, and is an eligible building that is worthy of historic landmark status. So staff, did have one concern uh, based on the application that was submitted that is related to the proposed landmark boundaries and the treatment of the athletic fields along Woodburn Avenue and the conservation guidelines that are proposed. So while the guidelines allow for new construction along Woodburn Avenue, they require an outdoor area should be retained. However, the size and location of that area is not explicitly defined. Also, as new development along Woodburn would likely take up the majority of the fields for the building site and required parking, staff is unsure how this requirement would be applied. So the guidelines also require looking to the surrounding residential development around Woodburn Avenue to guide new infill design. However, these buildings are not located within the proposed boundary for this property, nor are they within another historic district. So as Infill development is desired by the applicant. Staff would recommend reducing the proposed boundaries to the top of the rear terrace to the east of the school. This would allow for the preservation of the main school building itself, as well as its primary landscape features along the Durrell and Victory Parkway frontage, while allowing for that desired infill development along Woodburn Avenue, which would simply follow the standard zoning regulations for the district in which it's located. Uh, so that Boundary proposed by staff would ensure that the school retains its character defining features and would still effectively convey its significance under criteria one and three. So this, this approach has been successfully utilized on other historic school building nominations in the city, specifically the Kirby Road School in Northside, which was converted to a residential use with the landmark boundary being drawn at the rear building line of the school, allowing for future residential infill development behind the school building itself. So um, aside from that one concern on the, the boundary and the conservation guidelines, uh, staff 
feels that this building is clearly an eligible building that has identi been identified as such by multiple surveys, as well as the Ohio Historic Preservation Office and staff feels that it is uh, worthy of designation. So with that in mind, staff recommends the Historic Conservation Board take the following actions that they recommend to the Cincinnati City Planning Commission and to the C Cincinnati City Council for the designation of a portion of tax parcels 055-0002-0039 through 055-0002-0041 and 055-0002-0049 through 055-0002-0054, also referred to as 3060 Durrell Avenue and known as the Hoffman School as a historic landmark and the adoption of the related Hoffman School conservation guidelines subject to the following conditions. A, prior to appearing before the Cincinnati Planning Commission, the boundary shall be revised to, the, to extend to the top of the easternmost terrace as shown in figure four of the staff report. B, prior to appearing before the Cincinnati Planning Commission, the conservation guidelines shall be amended to remove references to the new construction in the athletic field area along Woodburn Avenue. C, any construction proposed within the historic landmark boundaries shall comply with the proposed historic conservation guidelines. Also, staff recommends the Historic Conservation Board approved submission of a letter of support to the Ohio Historic Ohio Historic Site Preservation Advisory Board for any potential future National Register nomination and makes the following finding. And I would note on the finding, there is a typo in A in regards to the code language that is cited. Uh, it reads 1435-07-1A1, and that should read 1435-07-1A3. So the finding, would be the board makes this determination per section 1435-07-1 that it has been demonstrated that the Hoffman School meets the conditions of 1435-07-1A3 as the building maintains integrity and embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type period method of construction or that represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction. B, the Hoffman School building has local significance as an excellent example of Jacobethan revival, st revival style architecture in Cincinnati. C, that it has been demonstrated that the Hoffman School meets the conditions of 1435-07-1A1 as the building maintains integrity and represents an association with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. D, the building retains an exceptional level of historic integrity, and E, that the proposed Hoffman School conservation guidelines are compatible with the Secretary of Interior's standards for rehabilitation. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Um, we do have the applicant for this uh, submission is uh, with us today, and we're going to give the applicant the opportunity to present their case first. Um, so I believe that uh, Cincinnati Preservation Association has a few uh, speakers today. Ms. Johnson, are you speaking on behalf of the, the organization? Um, yes, we are speaking on behalf of the organization. I'm speaking on behalf of Cincinnati Preservation Association, and then we would like to reserve time at the end um, to respond to comments as well. Okay. Uh, can we get everyone who is representing you, um, aside from your attorney, uh, sworn in? So we actually, uh, Madam Chair, we actually don't need sworn testimony for this because it's a because it's a legislative item. Great, thank you for the clarification. Sure. Okay, Ms. Johnson, uh, I will turn it over to you to present uh, your uh, case. Um, thank you to the Historic Conservation Board for letting us um, be here today. I am Beth Johnson, the Executive Director of Cincinnati Preservation Association. We are here today as part of the historic landmark designation hearing for the Hoffman School. The opposition to this designation will be putting a lot of arguments in front of you regarding their opinions on if the building can or should be rehabilitated. However, the question that the Historic Conservation Board has to answer is simply if it meets the criteria for historic significance according to Chapter 1435 of the Cincinnati Zoning Code. One argument that the owner and her lawyers 
um, have and will make is that Cincinnati Preservation Association does not have legal standing to apply. According to the Cincinnati Zoning Code, Cincinnati, or, according to the Cincinnati Zoning Code 1435-07A, Preservation Association is listed as a community organization which has rights to submit a designation application. CPA has been a recognized applicant for many historic designations accepted by the city as a legitimate applicant under this section of the zoning code. The owner's representative stated that there was not collaboration with the Evanston Community Council on the application. I had been in contact with members of the Community Council, including members of their executive committee about the proposed demolition in CPA's interests in supporting the designation application. After being informed that the neighborhood voted to not support demolition of the building by the developer, in consulting with the city adopted 2019 Evanston work plan, which calls for exploring the designation of the Hoffman School, DPA did proceed with the designation application and did inform the community council. It is also to note that the pastor of the church that owns the building also took part of this 2019 work plan where the building was listed as an important historic asset by the community. The owner's representative also argues that Hoffman School does not meet the criteria for designation. As you're all very well aware, the city standards for designation mirror the National Park Service standards for designation to the National Register of Historic Places. The State Historic Preservation Office, who's the authority in Ohio on qualifying for the National Register of Historic Places, had made a determination through the National Register questionnaire that this property is eligible for listing on the National Register. It has also been found to be eligible in a 1998 inventory done for the Cincinnati Public Schools, which it is also the cover picture for that inventory report further showing its importance. The 1978 and updated 2001 to 2004 inventory that the city sponsored also found that the property contributes greatly to the historic and architectural quality of the city. Finally, your own urban conservator agrees with the experts as he himself is also an expert and his recommendation should be followed. As the experts and even the city's own inventory have found that this is eligible, the decision for you is fairly easy. The opposition argues that the building is not important as in their opinion, it does not have association with the progressive era of school design or the city beautiful movement. However, in the designation report, it shows that it does meet the standard that the school was designed with elements that were part of the progressive area design, such as the gymnasium, lunchroom, and outdoor play space. This was significant uh, and was an early school in Cincinnati to adopt and incorporate these elements. The opposition also argues, argues that the school is not architecturally significant. I have already presented to you numerous experts, including the State Historic Preservation Office and the Urban Conservator, who disagree. One of the arguments is that the property has to be unique. Nowhere in the criteria standard in 1435 of the Cincinnati Zoning Code does it say unique. This is conjecture and confusion on how to interpret the actual criteria for significance. If the standard was, if the standard was that the building had to be unique, I would also argue that it is unique as how many other buildings have large carved owls that adorn the facade. The opposition also argues incorrectly that we stated that it was that it was associated with Samuel Hannaford. This was never stated in the designation report, as we clearly say that it was associated with Samuel Hannaford and Sons. This firm was an important firm in Cincinnati from 1887 to 1964, and it lasted decades after Samuel Hannaford passed away. Samuel Hannaford and Sons are the architect for many important buildings, such as Memorial Hall, City Hall, the Phoenix Club the Citadel, Emory Auditorium, and the Time Star Building. All of these are buildings that are listed as local landmarks around the National Register of Historic Places for their architecture and being associated with the works of a master. Being associated with the works of the master also further supports that it meets criteria and theory for its architectural significance. If referring back to the how to apply the National Register criteria for evaluation, what it does say is that further in further explanation by the National Park Service, to be eligible, a property must clearly contain enough of those characteristics to be considered a true representation of a particular type, period, or method of construction. In a list of Jacob Ethan architectural features provided in the designation report, this building contains almost every feature. So to say that it doesn't represent the style of architecture is not accurate as it clearly contains the majority of the characteristics. As the designation has shown, the building clearly meets criteria one and three. The opposition will also be making other arguments that are not part of the criteria for evaluation of significance, but we do want to address some of those as well. 
One, they're going to state that it's economically infeasible to rehabilitate the school. This is not an economic hardship hearing, and these arguments should not be considered in this hearing. However, with that said, there have been several developers who've expressed interest in the property, as the property was never officially listed for sale with MLS or LoopNet, to say there have been no other interested parties until this developer is not accurate. While we know it is not for the public to decide what developers should be allowed to work on a property, it is for the city to decide if the property should be preserved. Once the property is designated, if after investigation by developers with historic, re with historic rehabilitation background, the building is not able to be reused, then an economic hardship case may be made. Any economic hardship claim is also for the building and not the specific owner. We think that the work that the church does for the community is great, and we do, want, we do not want to get in the way of them selling the school. However, they can still sell the school with a landmark designation. It will, an argument will also be made that there's too much asbestos in the building, but the report that they've submitted has a lot of speculations and assumptions. Further, if the building were to be demolished, it would still be required to have abatement as these materials do not go into landfill. So there is a cost associated either way in regards to abatement, and it's not a cost just associated with rehabilitation. The owner and the developer claims that the building is a public hazard. However, there are no current orders for demolition or public hazard orders or orders for the building to be vacated. Many in the neighborhood have said they didn't know that the building was in bad condition until the desire to demolish the building was stated. While the building has suffered from deferred maintenance, the building is not a public hazard. In fact, the week the designation application was submitted, there was a basketball game being played in the school. To conclude, what I what is before you is a pretty simple question. Does this building meet the criteria for being considered historically significant or not? as set out in chapter 1435 of the Cincinnati Zoning Code. As numerous experts have expressed through the Ohio Historic Inventory Forms, city-sponsored inventories, the school district-sponsored inventory, and the State Historic Preservation Office, and your urban conservator, the building is very clearly historically and architecturally significant building. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Is anyone else from your organization going to speak on this application? No. Okay. Well, we will move on then to uh, testimony or, or presentation of cases from the uh, church, uh, the owner of the building, and from Kingsley. I will leave it up to the two of you to decide who goes first. Um, I can go ahead and go. My name is Alexis Schweitzer. I am an attorney um, representing the church's interest. Um, and I here, along with my colleague Patrick Hughes, represent Christ Temple Full Gospel Bas Baptist Church. Um, we did submit an opposition memorandum, and I kind of want to address a few of the things that Ms. Johnson uh, kind of briefly mentioned. She mentioned the National Register and how the Cincinnati, uh, the City of Cincinnati Code of Ordinances, adopted the criteria. Uh, promulgated by the National Register. And the National Register also put forth um, guidance on how to construe that criteria. Um, so first and foremost, the Ohio State Constitution specifies certain inalienable rights, and among those rights are property rights. And additionally, the United States Constitution protects the right to property under the Fifth Amendment. So it's an inescapable conclusion that Americans have a fundamental property right. And when administrative agencies or judicial bodies make decisions that purport to restrict this fundamental property right, those ordinances, regulations, and statutes which allow for this decision must be strictly construed in their application. So Ms. Johnson's statement that this is a fairly easy decision to make, I don't believe, I respectfully disagree um, because I don't think it is an easy decision to make when you are concerning a fundamental constitutional property right. Therefore, the city of Cincinnati ordinance, which allows for designation of a local historic landmark, it must be constri uh, strictly construed in its application. And now the CPA's application does not meet this high burden. And pursuant to the ordinance, um, as you guys are well aware, a structure may be deemed as having historic significance if it meets at least one of the attributes listed. And the Cincinnati Preservation Association argues under uh, subsections one and three. However, the Hoffman School does not meet the criteria set forth 
and the application and the, re uh, the evidence in the record thus far is not enough to satisfy these subsections when you're strictly construing them in the manner they are meant to be construed. Um, for the first criteria association with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history, the National Register set forth um, an excellent uh, guidance in how to construe this criteria and to be considered for listening under this section, the property must have an important association within the associated conducts. So it ha must have its own specific important association within the city beautiful movement and the progressive era of school design. While the Hoffman School has clearly been demonstrated to be associated with those movements, the record is devoid of any evidence that it has its own important association within that movement or importance uh, standing alone within those movements. And therefore the building does not meet the criteria under this uh, criteria for designation under the subsection. And while Ms. Johnson did reference Samuel Hannaford and Hannaford and Sons, um, again, I think that any reference to Samuel Hannaford or Hannaford and Sons is a red herring because of uh, one, the application was not submitted under criteria two for association with the lives of persons significant in our past. Um, and to be designated historic under this subsection, it's generally restricted to properties that illustrate rather than commemorate a person's important achievements. So properties that are eligible for uh, designation under the subsection are associated with a person's productive life, reflecting the time period that he or she achieved significance. Properties that pre or post date an individual's significant accomplishments are not eligible. And as we all are well, well aware that this Hoffman School was um, clearly not associated with Samuel Hannaford's productive life as the building does post date his death. And any mention to Samuel Hannaford or Hannaford and Sons, while they are important in our history, is merely a red herring for this application because it does not support designation of the building. And finally, um, for the third subsection for eligibility for designation, um, they, CPA was required to prove that the property clearly demonstrates distinctive characteristics of the type, period, or method of construction. And uh, Ms. Johnson also referenced that there is no requirement that the building be unique. Um, while the term unique is not expressly utilized, it does, the Code of Ordinances does state that it must represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction. Significant distinguishable uh, entity whose components lack individual distinction by itself does evidence that the building must be unique. And the CPA's application or their historic designation report clearly shows that it is not a unique building and that there are several other buildings within the city that do exhibit the Jacobethan revival style architecture, which is the Roosevelt School, the McKinley School Edition, and the Central Fairmount School. And finally, the fourth subsection is moot because there has been no evidence in the record to um, show that the Hoffman School has yielded or is likely to yield uh, information important in prehistory or history. Uh, additionally, the Evanston work plan, while it does, um, it does provide that the um, Evanston Community Council wanted to explore designation of the Hoffman School as a local historic landmark. The number one goal of the 2019 Evanston work plan was to create sustainable mixed income housing without displacement. And the Evanston work plan acknowledged that housing is an essential need for all people in their community and that their goal is to ensure that the affordable housing crisis does not impact the residents of Evanston. Um, the Kingsley and Company's plan for the Hoffman School, which I'm sure that they will be able to elaborate on further, was to rebuild affordable mixed income housing for the Evanston community. And there have been a lot of references to interested developers, um, but these hypotheticals should not be, uh, are not appropriate for consideration because they are merely hypotheticals and they are not um, concrete plans 
that are, have been set in motion for the Hoffman School, while Kingsley and Company has a concrete plan to rebuild and provide affordable mixed income housing for the Evanston community, which is directly in line with the Evanston's um, primary goal in their 2019 work plan. And although there are there is a step down the road to potentially, if this application is approved, to potentially explore economic feasibility and de demolition, I think that it's something that should be considered now because it is an added cost and it is an added step. And like I said, um, property rights are a fundamental constitutional right of Americans and the ordinances should be strictly construed in their application. And if it is done that way, um, it is clear that the Hoffman School does not meet the criteria for designation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will turn it over to the representatives from Kingsley to make their case. Hi, I'm Sonia Gentle Tork from the Taft, Titanius and Hollister Law Firm, and I'm joined by my colleague, um, Kit Halston, as legal representatives for Kingsley Investment Group. Um, Kingsley opposes the CPA's proposed designation, and we have submitted a written brief to the board in support of our opposition. Uh, Kingsley is the real estate developer that has a legal interest in 3060 Durrell and has been under contract to purchase the property from the church um, since June 22 of last year. Uh, Kingsley is scheduled to close on the property in the coming weeks and based on that expectation um, has expended a significant amount of time, money and resources over the course of the year conducting due diligence, studying the property and its potential uses and creating a redevelopment plan that will um, not only activate an unsafe and hazardous building, but also bring critically needed affordable and mixed income housing to the city and the Evanston community. Um, and the plan is consistent with the Cincinnati Zoning Code's historic preservation rules and purposes, uh, the overall purposes of the Zoning Code and uh, the city approved plans for the city of Cincinnati and Evanston. Um, we agree with the church's position and aren't going to spend time reiterating their points, um, but Mr. Halston is going to walk through some additional points regarding our position. Um, we would also like to have the opportunity to present um, the testimony of Tina Doom and Duke Way, who is the principal and founder of Kingsley, um, Daniel Buckenroth, um, Kingsley's development associate, um, and the opinion of our expert architect, George Berardi of Berardi Plus Architects, who has um, evaluated the, uh, the site and building. Um, we also request the opportunity to cross-examine uh, Beth Johnson of the CPA. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Kit Houston now. Thank you, Sonia. Um, so assuming that we will have the opportunity to call witnesses, I can be relatively brief in our presentation today. Um, as Sonia indicated, we, <clears throat> agree with and adopt entirety of the church's brief, uh, the owner's brief, as well as their statements today to the board. Um, so we just have a few things to add uh, that we think were maybe not uh, addressed by the staff or, or by the church. Uh, Cincinnati zoning code should be read as a whole, just as, as any other statute should. Um, and, and the zoning code in several locations sets forth its various purposes, which is to be considered as a balancing test. Uh, none of these other purposes have been discussed, uh, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, so the board would look to section 14003 as well as 143503. It can see the numerous different purposes of the zoning code um, and how it should be construed uh, to effectuate an equitable result. Uh, some of these include the, achie the achievement um, or arrangement of land uses described in the comprehensive plan. As touched on by the, by the church, the 2019 Edmonton plan uh, calls for affordable and mixed use housing, which is exactly what Kingsley intends to do with the property. Um, it also calls for providing opportunities for economic development and new housing for all segments of the community. Again, the development will do this. Um, and while it does call for preserving and, and conserving historic resources, it is but yet one factor that should be considered uh, for the totality of the zoning code. Um, the development uh, proposed by Kingsley will also promote the public health, safety, and welfare, uh, one by removing uh, what's becoming rapidly a dangerous structure um, from the community and replacing that with uh, very nice, affordable and mixed use housing. 
um, that will stabilize and increase property values and will also strengthen the local economy. So what is Kingsley doing? Um, exhibit A to our letter to the board will give you some good insight as to how this development may look, uh, approximately 250 uh, new housing units. Um, if, if this application is denied, uh, the development has the potential to move forward. It'll facilitate economic growth with African-American participation, again, another target of the 2019 Evanston plan. Um, and it will alleviate and remove a dangerous property that poses a real risk to the community. As you've seen in our, our letter, uh, there's already stones have already fallen from the structure, nearly striking a child. Uh, you can see in the pictures, it's evident that these stones are continuing to de deteriorate. And if this application is denied, this structure can come down and be replaced with a, a, a structure that will actually serve the needs of the community. Um, if it's granted, what will happen? The, the building will sit there, it'll continue to deteriorate. There's no evidence that's been submitted uh, that any developers are actually interested in investing the significant funds it would take to rehabilitate this building. Um, our estimates of rehabilitation costs run between $400 and $500 a square foot. It's significant. 2,000 square feet of, of rehabilitation would be roughly a million dollars uh, to put that in perspective. The average home in Cincinnati uh, with 2,000 square foot range is probably between two hundred fifty and three hundred fifty thousand dollars. So it, the the cost to rehabilitate this building is is dwarfed in comparison to what can be put there for affordable housing, which is a crisis this city this city as well as the rest of the country is dealing with. Uh, we also note that the filing by the applicant was exceptionally last minute. This property has been identified as potentially having historic significance uh, over 20 years ago, I do recall. Uh, 10 years ago, it was uh, public, publicly auctioned to a private developer. No applications were made. Uh, various community outreach uh, programs done by Kingsley were, were ignored, only to have this application filed at the last minute. And again, there's no real plan if it's granted. There, there, there's no real plan to actually preserve this building. It'll continue to deteriorate. Uh, as to, the, as to the CPA's um, assertions under criteria one, um, the Hoffman School holds no real significance in history. It's Jacobian architecture, and, and that's it. That, uh, that's really the only basis for the application. There's no such thing as Jacobian school architecture. Uh, the school is just a use. There's other, there's other Jacobian architecture within the city as identified in the report itself. Um, yet we don't know that any applications have been filed on any of these properties. Um, so even assuming this building was, quote, associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history, ironically, the designation would only further the disproportionate impact the failed progressive era and City Beautiful movement had on minorities by depriving this community of affordable housing. So let's not continue our same mistakes of the past. As to Criterion 3, uh, this is not a significant structure at all. It's been modified as as pointed out in the church's brief to have to install an elevator, and it is certainly not well preserved. We encourage you to review the pictures submitted. Um, even if it were, again, there are other examples of this architecture in the city. Funds, should, funds and resources should be focused towards these buildings who hopefully are not as deteriorated as the, uh, the building before this body. Um, with that, that, that would conclude our comments for today. Again, we would request to be able to call uh, uh, several witnesses if the board is agreeable. Please go ahead with calling your witnesses. Okay, we'll call first uh, George Berardi. Mr. Berardi, when you're off mute, please let us know. Okay. Hi, uh, can you please just state your name for the record? Uh, yes, George Berardi, last name is spelled B-E-R-A-R-D-I. Thank you, Mr. Berardi. Mr. Berardi, what is your profession? Uh, I'm a licensed architect. And how long you've been practicing architecture? 43 years. Are you familiar with historic buildings and what may qualify a building as historic? Yes. Is your practice have any focus on historic buildings? We have a significant focus on it, although it's um, combined with other, other work. Uh, we've completed uh, the major buildings in the city of Cleveland, Toledo, and, and around the country. So yeah, we have a a specific reference to historic re uh, rehabilitation. Thank you. Um, 
including in Kingsley's letter slash briefing to this body was a letter from you to uh, Chen and Duque dated April 18th, 2023. Do you recall writing that letter? Yes, I do. Do you stand by all the assertions made within that letter? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, can you ex just explain to everyone present today what Jacobian architecture is? Well, it's simply a style. Uh, it was uh, came, references were uh, came out of the Renaissance period. Uh, largely, material uses included the brick, stone detailing, arches, bays. There are a variety of things that I think uh, Mr. Owens addressed some of them before. Uh, so I, I think that it's just a style, uh, much as um, Victorian style or another style uh, is included. Is there, to your not, I'm sorry, if you're finished, um, if not, please let me know. Um, is there such thing as Jacobean school architecture? No, not really. Um, there are examples of uh, Jacobean architecture applied to schools, but uh, there are schools that were log cabins for that matter. And uh, we can take it all the way up to the international style school. So there have been styles of architecture applied to any use and schools is certainly one of them. So is it fair to say that Jacobean was described by the features of the building, not the use of the building? Yes. What, what you, it's my understanding that you have analyzed potential um, adaptive reuse of the property at issue, is that correct? Right. But what are the constraints in your mind to adaptive reuse of this property? I, I, I believe that uh, much as I mentioned in my letter that you referred to, I gave an example of this building is approximately 60,000 square feet uh, and our adaptation of, of the building would provide not more than 22 dwelling units. Uh, if you take a look at what 22 dwelling units out of 60,000 square feet uh, would provide that somewhere in the order of an attributable gross building area of 2,600 square feet per dwelling units. And the dwelling units uh, that the Kingsley Group is, is uh, interested in, in uh, providing for the community at large are largely one and small two bedroom units, which are usually at tops. Uh, the total gross building areas attributed to those units may be 1,000 to 1,200 square feet, maybe more 1,000 uh, and less for the one bedroom units, a little bit more than a uh, thousand, closer to 1200 for the two. So my whole point is that um, ideally you would want to have in a building an attributable gross building area per unit of approximately 80% of the total area of the building. This building has approximately 30% uh, efficiency effectively, 30% of the space that's within the school could be absorbed for practical uses for residential purposes. Uh, it's made up of large public spaces, which are absolutely wonderful, but they're not adaptable to uh, any uh, use for the intended uh, development. So it is very difficult to really modernize a building like this. It would be wonderful uh, to go ahead and have each classroom could be, which is the way we arrived at the number 22, each classroom could be a dwelling unit. Uh, they would be somewhere in the order of 800 square feet in and of themselves. But then when you add the additional public spaces to it, it really increases the amount of attributable building area that's associated with, with each building, or with each dwelling unit, which makes it effectively not affordable. To construct. When we say not affordable, you got a ballpark estimate about what a unit would go for if it was uh, adapted into, let's just say, condominiums. Well, new construction, you may be looking at uh, somewhere around $200,000 to $225,000 per unit for a one or two bedroom unit, where this would be considerably more at, uh, in the $400 per square foot range, as you've indicated. That's not unusual. Thank you. Um, can you tell us, uh, are you familiar with a Section 106 review? Yes. Can you tell this body, not to insult the body, I'm sure they know what it is, but for the record, can you tell us what a Section 106 review is? Well, Section 106 essentially is that, uh, and then boiling it down to just one or two sentences, really comes down to if there is any federal uh, assistance or, or federal dollars that go into a project, it triggers a Section 106 review by State Historic Preservation Office, where in effect they evaluate um, uh, the property uh, for its significance. 
And I believe you mentioned in your letter that there's potential issues with a Section 106 review on this, the property at issue. Is that correct? Well, the, the issues are um, related to not being effectively, you know, what I've suggested in my letter was that uh, you have to stay within Secretary of the Interior's uh, schedule for rehabilitation in order to go ahead and really comply with um, Section 106. Okay. Um, in, in your opinion, is this property historically significant? Um, you know, my opinion um, is that most often significance is uh, often needs to be measured in terms of the potential for reuse in any building that we're involved in. Uh, at one point, the property held significance, um, greater significance than today uh, for its intended original use. So it was significant. And it was a good example of Jacobean architecture, period. Um, the property is in disrepair and uh, with anything, uh, whether a building or a car or any constructed or manufactured good, uh, there is a useful life. And the useful life of this building is effectively depleted. There were comments made earlier about maintenance. It's, it, there, was, there was really, it wasn't a question of maintenance being deferred. It was a question of maintenance not occurring in this building, which is why I even suggested in my letter that it continues to be suffering and depleting in value. And by the way, one other comment that I'd like to make about the basement. There won't be any basement. There, will, there is no plan to have a basement in the building. Uh, the building would be brought down to grade and street level. Okay, we have no further questions for Mr. Berardi. Uh, we would yield to cross-exam if that's the procedure of this body. Actually, cross-examination is not um, allowed in, in this type of proceeding for this board. No objection from us. Um, we'd like to call our next witness, Mr. Chen and Dupuy. Chris, can you hear me? Jay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Great. Can you state your name for the record, please? So my, my name is Chinadum Kingsley Ndukwe. And Mr. Ndukwe, can you uh, tell us what your profession is? I'm a commercial real estate investor and developer. And how long have you been uh, in the developing properties? Uh, since 2009. 2009. What... Is there any specific types of uh, developments you focus on, or can you tell us a little bit about the, the spread of the portfolio, if any? Sure. Yeah, we, we primarily focus on underutilized properties within um, downtown metropolitan areas. We focus on Cincinnati, Columbus, Ohio, and Dayton at this point. So is that has a lot to do with affordable housing, I would imagine. Is that correct? Yeah, we we honestly we focus on we focus on limited service hospitality and uh, multifamily with uh, a high focus on affordable housing. Uh, we're currently uh, finishing up a nine percent low income housing tax credit award um, in Avondale. We're getting ready to break ground over the next uh, forty five days on an additional fifty unit uh, affordable housing project in uh, neighborhood of Paddock Hills. So very in tune with affordable housing, but also multifamily uh, redevelopment. Great. So it sounds like you've had some success uh, with building uh, affordable housing developments within the city. Is that, is that fair to say? That's correct. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can you tell us about the proposed development um, at the former Hoffman School site? Sure. I mean, it, it really get, it really falls in line with our philosophy of looking at um, properties that are underutilized. Um, and really could create uh, not just affordable housing, but market rate housing. As many of you guys know, in Hamilton County, there's such a significant housing crisis. I mean, people all obviously focus on the affordable housing piece, which is critical, but also um, there's a desperate need for quality workforce housing and market housing. And we plan to um, redevelop the entire site and create close to 250 um, mixed income housing that would have market rate, workforce, and affordable. Is it fair to say that um, Exhibit A to the letter we submitted on your behalf is a fair representation of the intended development at this time? That's correct, yeah. 
Um, are you familiar with the potential costs to repurpose the building? The existing 3060 Durrell building? Yes. I mean, it, it would be extremely significant, um, well beyond economically feasible. That would really eliminate any opportunity for that to be remotely affordable. Um, and, and, you know, and, and George uh, Berardi, who, you know, some of you guys may or may not be familiar with his background, is one of the most prolific, prolific um, historic um, architects in Ohio, in the Midwest, probably across the country. Um, he's done a number of the successful um, historic renovation projects in Cleveland, in Cincinnati, um, throughout the state of Ohio. And, you know, there wasn't anybody that really studied that building more than George uh, about looking, how can we really lay this out so it would make sense. And at the end of the day, the economics associated with redeveloping this building is, is does not pencil. So it sounds like what you're saying is Kingsley did consider uh, re repurposing the building, but found it cost prohibitive. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, we, we've we spent an, a, a significant amount of time studying this facility, studying the structure, doing inspections. Um, but, you know, there, there's so many. And we first looked at this as an affordable housing play. What's happened since since we went under contract was H House Bill 45. Uh, which no longer allows historic tax credits to be merged with low-income housing tax credits, which uh, we're one of the few companies in Hamilton County that have been successful in securing those low-income housing tax credits. Um, and with that passing that bill, the only pathway we actually saw to really keep um, that building upright could have been an affordable housing route. But unfortunately, with that uh, passing of that legislation, and then just the rising cost of construction, it really is not feasible um, at this time. Thank you. Um, it, we all heard Mr. Berardi speak about the constraints with repurposing the building. Do you have anything to add on top of what was said by Mr. Berardi? You know, in, in George and his team, um, we've actually been working on 3500 Montgomery Road for you guys. The historic board should be familiar with that property. Um, it's also located in Evanston. Um, his team has spent countless hours. Our team has spent countless hours on that project. It was a project that um, we'd had on a contract with the Archdiocese. Um, we'd study that building significantly. We ended up moving forward. Um, and since we've moved forward with that project, the construction cost and the gap um, to really redevelop that church, 3500 Montgomery Road, um, is coming up close to $4 million. And I think as we're talking about this specific property, 3060 Durrell, I think part of what I believe the historic board should take into consideration is what's the plan? You know, what, what is truly the plan? And is this the best route um, for this site? And quite frankly, with the affordable housing, the market rate housing and the workforce housing need in Hamilton County, I think it's clear I don't think it makes sense. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunities outside of 3060 Durrell for the historic um, society, the CPA, um, to work with existing um, certified historic facilities. We would love to work with the CPA. We'd love to work with the historic board on 3500 Montgomery Road. We actually have two other historic properties that are currently under contract right now that we would welcome the opportunity to work in partnership on a clear path to redevelop. Um, but with that being said, it, it, it is the timing of the CPA's application, quite frankly, the incompleteness of the application, and then the lack of plan um, and, and the circumvention and, and really the lack of respect um, that the CPA did with filing this without the permission of Pastor Mingo and his congregation. Um, it is disappointing. Um, I'm unfortunately not surprised. Uh, but at this time, you know, I, I think that we are really focused on having a positive work and relationship with the CPA on our other projects that we currently have in our pipeline and currently working on. Um, and really, you know, moving forward with redeveloping this site. And I think one other thing to note, Kit, is our plan is to keep the, um, the pool house that's on site. 
where our plan is to keep that erect. And we really want to work with the CPA on that piece um, as we move forward. Thank you so much. Um, no further questions uh, for Mr. Nduque. Uh, we would ask uh, uh, Beth Johnson at this time. Yeah. So again, uh, cross-examination is, is not really part of this type of proceeding. Um, I, will, I will leave that up to, to Ms. Johnson if she is open to answering questions. We understand. Ms. Johnson, are you willing to answer a few questions? This is Tim Burke. I'm counsel for Ms. Johnson and CPA. No, this is not a, a due process hearing. It's a legislative hearing that doesn't involve cross-examination. We would take a yes or no. That's fine. No, no further witnesses. Okay. I do have quite a few people signed up for this case, and it's a little bit unclear to me if, if everyone who wanted to speak from, from the ownership side of the case has spoken. So if you are here representing one of the owners, uh, either Kingsley or um, the church, and have not spoken and would like to, please let me know at this point. Yes, this is Daniel Buckenroth with Kingsley. Okay, uh, please uh, provide whatever uh, information you would like to. Yep, I'd just like to add, um, we've done community engagement sessions with the Evanston Community Council and then also um, Cincinnati's Economic Development. Um, so we've met with the local community council of Evanston roughly seven or eight times publicly. Um, at those, there was no mention of designating the building historic. Um, and then on February 16th, um, we went to vote on a letter of support to rezone the property. Um, the Evanston Community Council voted in favor to rezone the property to a PUD, which in our plan, we were demolishing the building to build the 250 um, mixed income housing units. And, and that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else from the ownership side that would like to add anything at this point? Okay, Ms. Johnson uh, and the C uh, CPA, you requested some time to respond. Uh, this is your time, and then we'll move into board questions and public comment. This is Tim Burke on behalf of CPA. Um, first of all, I think the board understands clearly the difference between the legislative process that we're engaged in today and the administrative process that would be involved in determining whether or not the building should be permitted to be demolished because it can't be financially saved. We're not doing cross-examination today and cross-examination would be available in the administrative proceeding at a later date cross-examination both of Ms. Johnson and of the witnesses for the applicant would be available at that time. But that's simply another reason why today the board is only looking at the question of whether or not the building is appropriate to be named as a historic landmark in the city of Cincinnati. You have ample evidence before you that it should be and is well qualified as a Cincinnati historic landmark, both from the various studies that have been previously done, naming it that, from Beth's own testimony today, and most critically, from your own expert who has looked clearly at the justifications for naming the building to be a historic landmark. We don't dispute the fact that as the council for the owner raised, it doesn't qualify under either two or four of the reasons for just for naming it a historic landmark. But as your own urban conservator has found, it clearly qualifies under one and Three. And I point out that even when counsel for the developer questioned his own historic witness, 
the one question that the historic witness had difficulty with was trying to answer what counsel for Nagukwe wanted. He never said that this building is not a historic building. In fact, he said, it is a historic building. His argument was simply that, as he put it, I believe, it's not as historic as it used to be because it has some difficulties with it. Nobody disputes the fact that the buildings has some, has some difficulty with it. That in the end is an issue to be resolved later in a different process than this, if in fact, ultimately the board, the planning commission and city council approve this property to be named as a historic landmark. Um, I would also point out that while the last speaker for Kingsley talked about the meeting before the Evanston Community Council, the Evanston Community Council specifically voted against a resolution that would have supported the building being demolished. That didn't happen. And as a result, it's not accurate to say that they voted in full support of the PUD as proposed because it did include a proposal that the building be demolished. That's all I have at this point. Thank you. Before we go on to public comment, I'd like to pause and ask if the board has any questions for staff, the applicant, or the ownership interests in this property. Um, Madam Chair, I do have a question for Mr. Owen. When, and I appreciate, I appreciate the, uh, the direction that you were going, Doug. When you um, define the boundary, the revised boundary, uh, <clears throat> if that building were to be, could be repurposed into say residential, you've got 17 plus classrooms, that's pushing 40 parks. Um, did you consider that? Or in other words, what, what kind of set where you thought the boundary should, should go there was the topography or did you consider parking if, so, if the building was repurposed? So the staff proposed boundary was mainly based on the applicant's desire for future development within the ball field. So that line that's proposed at the top of the rear terrace would preserve the historic, the most significant historic features of the property while allowing for that future development and parking and whatever else is needed for redevelopment to happen outside those boundaries. Thank you. Other questions from the board at this point? Okay, I will move on to public comments then. I do have several people signed up. Um, let's. I'll try to go through this list and, and see who we have checked in. Okay, it looks like we have uh, Ms. Sabrina Calkins. Is Sabrina present? Not seeing her. Uh, next, we have uh, Scott Clark. Mr. Clark, like to speak? Uh, if I may, I would actually like to hold my commentary until after uh, Mr. Cronin and the diversified um, capital management group have spoken. Okay, I will allow that. Mr. Cronin is next, um, so I will go to him. Thank you. Okay, we're unmuted, I hope. Yes. Excellent. We can hear you. Thank you. I'll keep this brief. Um, my partner, Steve, is going to tell you a little bit more about diversified capital. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Hoffman School. 
found out about the Hoffman School through an Instagram post. It's not exactly your traditional marketing platform. That's probably the biggest reason we're here today. It doesn't seem to have been marketed in any traditional manner. And I think if we're gonna solve this problem, we wanna consider three parties. We wanna consider both future and past generations, the community, and last but not least, the current legal owner. I don't believe these parties need to be at odds. There's no question this party or this property is significant, not only to the current generations, but past generations and future generations. Look, look at the structure and you can tell you can't make a credible argument against it. And as an owner of a construction company, there's no way I could recreate that facade profitably. The community has already voted 43 letters in support of landmark designation versus four opposed. For some reason, there seems to be a perception that the only exit strategy for the developer and the owner is to demolish the building. And frankly, I'm incredibly sympathetic to Mr. Mingo and his parish. You know, the whole idea of being forced to hold a building that you don't want, you can't afford, doesn't seem fair. That's why I'm here today. Mr. Mingo, you shouldn't be saddled with the debt or, you know, the high cost to keep this thing going. But you don't need to sell it to a developer who's going to destroy it either. If it is claimed repeatedly in letters to the staff that this landmark designation will terminate your deal, I want it to be on the record that Diversified Capital Management is fully prepared to make a seven-figure offer to acquire the school and the adjacent land. The deposit on this offer will be non-refundable. Furthermore, I want that offer to give you the accessibility to some of the deposit so that you can keep your parish room. Typically, they get thrown in escrow and you don't get to touch it. You have my word, if we get under contract, we'll close. And recently, I just completed a project that makes this thing look like a five-star resort. Uh, the board, you should have received 25 or so exhibits this morning attached to a letter from us. Shows that project. There's no question it's in far worse condition. Not a single interior wall was salvageable. Water, fire damage throughout. Junk floor to see. Now it's one of the nicest buildings in the community. So I'm gonna leave it with you, Mr. Mingo. Wouldn't you agree that a deal that gets you a competitive offer, honors the wishes of your community who's already voted not to demolish the building, promises to respect your parish, keep it going, pays homage to the current generation, past generation and future generations is indeed the best solution for everyone. In closing, I wanna remind everyone, this isn't about whether the community or Mr. Mingo and his parish win or lose. Both sides can win. Unfortunately, circumstances have painted a picture that landmarking this property owner and community are adversaries. This couldn't be further from the truth. The landmark status actually makes the building more valuable. Developers like myself will have access to tax credit dollars if it's landmark. Mr. If Cronin, I think we've I think we've reached uh, two minutes if you want to. I'll wrap it up in the next 30 quick. seconds. If it kills the current deal, I believe I can make a deal that will work for everybody. I want to iterate here. We're, we are looking into past and future generations. The community has already spoken not to take the building down. And last but not least, the parish deserves to sell this building. We can do that for them. And the best way to do so is by landmarking the building. If you look at the exhibits I provided, without a question, without a shadow of doubt, this building can be saved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, may I speak? Um, we we are at the public comment portion of the the, the presentation, um, so we're going to proceed with the list of, of speakers who have signed up from from the community. Mr. Mingo is on that list. You will have an opportunity in a moment to speak, Mr. Mingo. Okay. Um, we also have on the list uh, Steve Graw. Would you like to, to speak on this case? Yes, please. Okay, uh, as Mr. Uh, Berkey indicated, we do have a two minute limit for, for public comments. So I start. will not be long winded. I just wanna tell a little bit more about Diversified Capital. I'm Steve Grau, I'm the COO of the construction arm of Diversified Capital Management and also a Lieutenant with the Cincinnati Fire Department. I started with DCM four years ago because I wanted the challenge of creating a great place to work and to build a business that may one day benefit my children and our community. We're a company that takes extreme ownership in solving problems and we value transparency from top to bottom in order to bring value to our clients, our employees and the historic buildings we restore. Uh, DCM started developing property in the area in 2016. We were the winner of the 2023 Northern Kentucky Impact Awards medium-sized business for most impactful business in the region. 
We were the 2023 Inc. Magazine's number 32 fastest growing company in the Southeast region and number three in Kentucky. Um, we've been featured multiple times in Beyond the Curb Urban Living Tours, and we've featured twice on WCPO's Home Tours. We're featured in the East Rose Victorian Christmas Tour. Um, we're the winner of River City's Excellence in Preservation. Um, we create the most beautiful, durable properties that simultaneously respect the history of the builders before us while providing an A-class experience for our communities and our tenants who we will respect and empower to help us manage these buildings. We believe we can successfully rehabilitate this property and we have a long track record to prove it, which is why we support the landmarking status of this building. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I forget, is now a good time to loop back to Mr. Clark? Yes, thank you. Um, I am Scott Clark. I am the Historic Preservation Officer for the city of Newport, uh, just across the river. Uh, Mr. Cronin and Diversified Capital Management have been working in our historic areas uh, tw since 2016 and have consistently shown uh, a high degree of, of integrity in the work in which they do to be able to fair, deal fairly use their integrity and their stunning restorations of our historic properties. The one property that Mr. Cronin uh, referenced and had sent the photographs uh, was, a, was a building that dated back to uh, 1901 and had been abused severely. Uh, that is now uh, a residential property uh, that enhances the entire west side of Newport. Uh, Mr. Cronin has chosen for his personal residence that his, prop that his property management company is working on uh, the General James Taylor Mansion and is converting that building back from being a commercial property back to a single family home. This essential historic property uh, and his passion for historic preservation have told us that uh, he has the ability to move forward and to make a historic property a viable uh, investment both for the community as well as for his company and for the residents that the community serves. We are, uh, I am wholeheartedly in favor of the landmark designation for the Hoffman School in historic preservation. We, uh, the purpose is to identify, preserve and value and maintain the historic character and integrity of our buildings and the stories they represent. There, there's many from the past generation stories to be told and Mr. Cronin's uh, company and he personally have the ability to be able to uh, repurpose this building into an effective asset for the community. Clark, uh, next on our list, we have scrolling down. Uh, Donna Lugan. Is Donna still with us? Looks like Donna is here, but is muted. I will circle back. Uh, uh, Mr. Mingo, you are next on the list if you would like to uh, speak. Oh, I think you just muted yourself. I uh, still cannot hear you. Now can you hear me? Yes. I mean, thank you. Uh, first thing I'd like to ask is that how many of the members of the Cincinnati Historic Society have been in the building. You may have seen pictures, but have you been in the building? Uh, that building 
basically was gifted to the church uh, 11 years ago. If it had not been gifted to the church, Cincinnati Public Schools were making way to demolish that building, just as it did uh, Burden Elementary and Hino. Those were the plans for the building. It was gifted to us uh, because our athletic programs and our community programs were really being really blossoming. And we were never able to use all of the building uh, because of the problems with the building. Uh, three and a half years ago, the heating system went out completely. They no longer make those boilers. They don't even have parts for them. And our congregation has been dedicated to the point that through the winters, the last three winters, members have still supported our congregation. They have sat there with their coats on during the winter, suffering through that lack of heat. And if anyone from the preservation department or whatever, you know, would come in and worship with us during the winter, if they would go to one of the restrooms and see how hopeless it was, if they'd been in the cafeteria, to be dodging the, basically the ceiling parts that are falling. We were given an opportunity to leave this place. We were given an opportunity to purchase another building that would suit the needs of our congregation. Right now, that building might have sentimental value to some people, but it's unsafe. And when we approached the congregation and told them about someone wanted to help us out, someone had basically looked at our situation it was voted unanimously that we take advantage of this. I've heard someone mention about the community council. The community council did not, and I want to put an accent on that, did not vote to preserve the building. They did not give anything that said, yes, we want the building to stay. That did not happen. I don't know who you've talked to, but my wife and I have been at every meeting of community council this year. And someone said it was done in January. We were in January's meeting. There was no vote in January as to whether or not this building would be preserved. Come visit us. Walk through the building. I, I've heard what some of the developers have to say. But where have been these developers been for the last 10, 11 years? Evidently. Board of Education knew the condition of this building. 20 years ago, they had doubts with it. I was at the graduation that they had at this building in 2011. And I asked, what's going to happen with the building? I was told it's going to be demolished. And that's when we stepped in and asked, could we basically until then use the building? And we wanted an 18-month an eighteen month uh, obligation and we figured after the 18, there was no telling what would happen. And so we signed a lease with the Board of Education for 18 months. Developers and whatever people have come and looked at it, shook their heads, asked us that we own the property. At that time, we were leasing it. And then that fall, they came back and said, we're going to basically liquidate some of our properties. And they missed it high note, they missed Burton Elementary. And they said, I, building was number one on the list. And we asked what's going to happen if it doesn't uh, you know, be purchased at, at, at the auction. They said, going to demolish it. And where were all the people then before the building got to the condition it is now? Where were all of them stepping up and saying, hey, we can do this, we can do that. No one has come out to us with a plan. No one. No one. And we would have loved the historical society to get in touch with us this year. I mean, hey, I mean, we're not a, a very affluent congregation. We've got a lot of seniors, we've got a lot of youth. And if any of you look at the newspapers or basically hear the news, we, we even tried to get our heating system fixed, but uh, a young guy came, or not a young guy, he's younger than me, I'm 73, came in with an idea. He ripped us off for $40,000. For $40,000, it's a matter of record. We basically found charges. They said since he had purchased something that looked similar to what we might need, that it was basically it wasn't a criminal, a criminal uh, basically prosecution. They said it was a civil court matter. Then 
he unceremoniously died and we didn't get anything back. And so what are we saying is where, where have all you guys been? You know, come walk through the building, come sit in there with the water coming through the ceilings. Okay. Stand out there in the back parking lot when the wind's blowing and just hope that a brick don't fall and hit you on the head. Where have you guys been? But all of a sudden, this building has a lot of sentimental value. And that's exactly what it is, sentimental value. But I'll tell you what. Okay, the building was built in the 1800s. It was remodeled and somewhere in the 20s when the former principal, James Hoffman, left a lot of money to redo some things at, at the building. Okay, uh, I live in Evanston, been here 42 years. The house I live in is over 100 years old. Has a whole lot of sentimental value. We've raised 11 kids here. We've operated a lot of things for the community out of here. No one has come forward want to save our house. No, no one has come forward with anything to redo it. Mr. Mingo, I'm giving you a little leeway because you're part of, of the ownership stake in this, but if you could uh, wrap up your comments. The church voted. The church voted. I'm here to carry out the desires and designs of the congregation. Those of you who have been in authority, and quite a few have, uh, I look at you and you like you're well versed, like you're pretty well situated financially and whatever. You've been in situations where when something goes wrong, if you are the head, then the head has to answer to the congregation. The congregation said, we want out of here. They're tired of sitting in the cold. They're tired of dodging, ceiling, <laughs> what's falling down. That building on the first floor, a congregation of almost 200, there's only one toilet and the building was built like that for some reason just one toilet and they've suffered through it we were going to do some work to get this done and this done but every time we decided to get something done the building prevented it and so we sympathize and we we <laughs> we basically thank god for kingsley consulting that they would come to our rescue and see what was going on our congregation probably cannot survive another building. Uh, we just can't do it right now. Unless we receive funds that would allow us to do it. Congregation voted, okay? The congregation voted. We're here basically because of the needs and the desires and the wishes of the Christ Temple Full Gospel Baptist Church, okay? And everyone's looking at sentimental value historical value. What about people? Do people value? Do they matter? The desires of the congregation? Do they matter? It seems not to be. Thank you, Mr. Mingo. Uh, next on the list is uh, Mr. Michael Morrison. Would you like to add anything today? Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I, I come to this uh, meeting really to learn a little bit more about the situation. I'm a resident in East Walnut Hills. I, I went to high school just down the road at, at, at Walnut Hills and so remember this this building from that and I, I moved to this neighborhood um, from the Prospect Hill neighborhood uh, a couple years back, um, another kind of historic center right in the city. And I guess my comments mostly are around sort of from a citizen's perspective, just the broad nature of <clears throat> a couple of things. One is um, places matter, people matter. Um, you know, the fact that um, we're, we're talking about sort of the, the specifics around this, this one particular building, um, I agree kind of in its, um, in, in and of itself, um, the comments that I've heard from across the board that, um, it, maybe this one building uh, in and of itself uh, can be debated one way or the other. Um, but I, I guess for me, being a lifelong Cincinnatian and, and living in a city that has has history and has place, um, that those things matter broadly across our, our city. And, and that fabric is really very much a part of this community. And, and I, I appreciate, you know, uh, the history that people can recollect with this building, um, growing up and being around it and uh, driving past it and and uh, my kids um, and we we have a t-ball team that plays on the field 
Um, I think it's it's run by CRC, but the the church graciously allows them uh, to uh, uh, to rent that out to to football teams and baseball teams, and and so that that very much is a community asset. Um, the green space, in addition to to the the building itself, and so. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will move on to our next speaker, Mr. Joe Pearson. Mr. Pearson, would you like to add anything? I'm sorry, was Mr. Murison accidentally muted? I think he may have. Been. Oh, maybe it looked like he stopped talking though, so I thought maybe he was done. Mr. Murison, did you were you finished? Um, I, I think you guys got the, the the point there a little bit. I just um, I, I, it seems like it's a um, it's a tough place that the church is in, and, and there's a lot of um, empathy, I think, from our community um, generally for that. And that what's very clear to us is that there aren't good options right now on the table. And so we would encourage collectively everybody as part of this, uh, including people that live in this community and neighboring communities, that we very much want the church um, to be able to do what they need to do for their congregation. That's very, very important. Um, but so is place and so is building, the, the building itself, so is the green space. And so I, I know there's a solve here, it's been solved in lots of communities all over the country and, and in particular in Cincinnati. Um, so I'm not an expert in, in the rehabilitation, but I know that this can be solved. Um, and, and for whatever reason, the, the, the folks haven't been involved uh, to give Mr. Mingo and his church those options. Um, but uh, it, it sounds like that's, that's where this lands. Thank you. Uh, now on to Mr. Pearson. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Pearson. I'm an attorney and architectural historian out of Louisville. Uh, this one was brought to my attention. Um, I've worked on dozens of historic school projects across the Midwest. Uh, and we've created hundreds and in some cases, thousands of units, both affordable and market rate. Converting schools, historic schools to housing using the Secretary of the Interior standards is a well-worn path. And one look at the status update page from the Park Service shows that it's done successfully every single day. In fact, it's done so successfully and so regularly that both the Ohio SHPO and the National Park Service provide guidance on almost every aspect of the design to make sure that uh, the process is handled well and that everybody walks away with what they're supposed to. The Hoffman School is an obvious candidate for conversion. It easily meets National Register criteria A and C, both for its architectural contributions and as an integral piece of the story of education within the Cincinnati community. The comments of those opposing designation reflect a disappointing lack of experience and appreciation in dealing with historic buildings, rehabilitation, and the process, both at the planning stage and the operating stage. I support a landmark designation for this property, and I encourage the board to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pearson. Uh, next on the list is uh, Karen Stanley. Not seeing Ms. Stanley. I will go on to the next uh, signed up speaker, which is Shay Stewart. Moving right along, uh, uh, Garland Waleko. Do it. Hi, I'm Garland. You can't, okay, there I am. Um, this is my partner, Jake. And Hello. he's going to provide comments on our behalf. All right. So my name is Jacob Knight. I was also signed up for this, but we just joined together. Um, We're together. So um, we own a, a house and we've been restoring a house on Merrimack Street right next to the Hoffman property. Um, and so um, we're just here as citizens and neighbors and Evanston, soon to be residents. And um, we both support the church being able to sell the property, um, but we feel like there's this stark contrast or a false choice um, presented at, at this and, and the April hearing on historic designation um, that either the church sells the Hoffman School to this one specific develop, developer and it gets torn down, 
or the church is just stuck. And we think that there is a middle ground, a middle path, um, whereby the church can continue its work and find a more suitable location for its congregation without uh, leaks or damage. Um, and at the same time, preserve the Hoffman building for future use as the church has done for the past decade, um, whatever that use may be. Um, hopefully, um, the church also values what its neighbors think. Um, and we just found out about this um, plan development also on, I think, Instagram or social media or just word of mouth, somebody telling us, hey, look at this. Um, so we hope uh, that the church will work with the community also toward a, a better outcome for everybody, because we only have one chance to get this right. Um, once it's gone, it's gone forever. Um, and buildings like this with great craftsmanship, um, the scale of it, inspiring grandeur, and uh, physical lasting investment in the neighborhood aren't built today. Um, it's a symbol that that our community matters um, and that the place is also is worth a building like this. Um, so having bu buildings like this and green space where people live matters and it will matter to us. Um, and we think that Hoffman can continue to be a landmark and source of pride for the neighborhood. And for those reasons, we support the historic designation of the building. Um, as property owners ourselves, we understand that when you live in a city, there are all kinds of rules and considerations um, that we all have to abide by. Even when it comes to work we're doing on our own house, we can't just do whatever we want. Uh, a building with historic value, community significance, prior public use, current nonprofit use, demands even greater care and consideration of the impacts to the community. The historic designation for this building is provision um, that we believe is necessary to preserve the great past investments and um, to encourage thoughtful future investments that build on the legacy of that spirit in which these buildings were created. Uh, so thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Wilson. I submitted my remarks, Allison, to the staff. So thank you. I don't have anything else. Okay, thank you. Um, Zoe Zhao. Oh, she wasn't signed in. Uh, Robert Smith. Sure, thanks for the opportunity to be able to speak on behalf of the public um, and interest in the property. So I am um, an investor and I um, have land and sales properties in that area, um, in the Evanston area. A um, couple of things that I wanna say, I'm familiar with the building. I've been in the building, I've worshiped with the church. And I just want to let you know that I echo whatever the church is the decision. I believe it's the church's uh, decision. They voted on it unanimously. And I think that was their choice. That was their option. I think people need today's society to respect uh, people. We have democracy for a reason. And if the church has decided to do or make a move, I think they're entitled to. So I yield uh, my, I, I, I agree exactly whatever the church's decision is. I think that's what should be at stake here. Um, it's like this building, I'm familiar with the building. It's been in disarray over the years. Um, and it seems like all of a sudden now it's getting some publicity that people are having interest, but it's been there all along and just curious to the timing of the interest of this building. And again, I, whatever the church has decided, I think in America and democracy that, you know, this is the church that they have and they want to make a decision. I think they're okay and should be able to make that decision. And as the leadership and as the owner of the property, Cincinnati has a bunch of real estate that has been torn down, whether it's been historic or rehab in other areas. And I think that would be considered because it's just questionable about the timing of this one. It's just curious. So thanks for the time. Thanks for the opportunity to be able to share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn Ritchie. Not seeing. Uh, Daniel Buckroth. Oh, I think that was with the ownership team. Apologies. Uh, I think I needed to go back and uh, call on Donna Lugan again. See if we have her present at, at this point. 
Not getting a response. I believe that I have called on everyone who has signed up. Is there anyone who has signed up for public comment that I did not call on? Okay. At this point, I will open it up to the board for questions and comments. I have a question for Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson, are you familiar with the term demolition by neglect? Yes. Yeah. Would you say that this is a pretty good example of that? I would not say that it's to that point, but without um, proper attention to the building, it could get to that point. But I would not say it's at the point right now where it is a point of no return with that with the building. Thank you. I have a question uh, for Mr. Owen. You are in your in the staff's recommendations uh, suggesting the boundary be revised, uh, guidelines be removed as to uh, future construction. Uh, why? Why is? Can you repeat for me why? you think that's necessary here? Uh, yes, so <clears throat> the conservation guidelines allow for development within the athletic field area along Woodburn Avenue, but say that they require an open space to be maintained, but there's no specifics on, on how large that open space should be or where it's located. And also um, the new info construction a lot along Woodburn, the, gui the proposed guidelines call for using the development surrounding that area along Woodburn Avenue to inform the new design for that info construction. However, that area around the, wood the Woodburn um, site is not within the boundaries of this property, the proposed boundaries, or within any other historic district. So um, it seems to me that the most straightforward way to approach the boundaries would be to, if development is desired within that open space, to set the boundary at the behind the existing building and allow the new construction along Woodburn to follow the regular zoning regulations. So this is something that, that the city has done previously on the Kirby Road School, which was nominated as a local landmark building. That boundary was set directly at the rear elevation wall of that building because there were plans to build new infill development in the open grassy area behind it. So I feel that setting that boundary at that location still preserves the most significant features of the school and still allows that building to convey its historic significance under one and three. Uh, Mr. Owen, my concern is uh, exactly what Mr. Zelasco said. Does it diminish the uh, economic models that might work on this project if, the, if we're eliminating that area is there and this may be a legal question is there a legal reason why we would have to limit uh, remove those sections from a designation uh is is that for me i'm not sure legally yeah i i, I think mr boss I, I think it just comes down to whether or not you know you think it has historic significance well, clearly there's uh, some wording that is creating a problem, but uh, the ball fields uh, were always part of that school system property. So um, I, I, I'm just trying to understand why, uh, why those three uh, addendums were added to the recommendation. So I, I think I better understand that. Madam Chair, 
I guess, I guess if I could ramble a little bit here, one, I, one I'm concerned, that, number one, the historic board has a purpose and it's, it, it's to help preserve where possible um, the heritage of the city. So that's our number one concern. And I am more than any other having 40 years of being a commercial architect in the development world. Uh, appreciate owners' rights, and, and it's a it's a very difficult place to be. But so, having said that, though, and it, this is not the last step, but we do. It, and I think I understand this correctly. If we designate a historic, it, it, it puts some more burden on the homeowner to go through some more steps. But it doesn't negate. I mean, the, the it can still be demonstrated that it's cost prohibitive to keep the school as it is. So that, that, that is not gone yet. So this is not an ultimate, it, but it does, it does create a little extra burden. I, I sorely appreciate Mr. Mingo's process. I have been involved in some schools that have been heavily vandalized and um, weathered <laughs> over the years. And I, I can actually appreciate what the inside of that school looks like. Um, if you haven't been in one, it's probably difficult to understand that, but the, the damage is, can be astronomical and the cost can be astronomical. So one though, I do have a problem with subdividing, proposing we subdividing the land without knowing that we've left that property basically without options for parking or it's repurposing or redeveloping if that's possible. And it, and it may be true what, what Chin said about not being able to combine the uh, tax incentives like you could a few years ago. I'm not familiar with the state of that now. Um, so having said that, it sounds like Mr. Cronin and Mr. Grove who are not on camera anymore are, are they throwing in an offer? <laughs> I mean, um, it, it sounds like they, and again, all of a sudden, okay, everybody's looking at it now. Well, now people are looking at it. And if there are other incentives there, or, you know, because it has kind of hit the headlines is, uh, could there be some offers that would maybe get Mr. Mingo out of a situation before the, the weather turns again? I know he's got other issues, but it sounds like weather's a pretty big one. Um, so I, to be honest, I don't know where I am on this. I, I, I feel like we should vote to preserve it and let the process run out. And then if, if Kingsley uh, wants to make the case that it's cost prohibitive, there, there is a path to do that. Um, but in the short term, if, if we miss this opportunity now, then uh, like somebody else alluded to, it, it is gone. That opportunity is gone. So that's. I will remind the board that this is just the first step in a process of designating um, a building. We would make a recommendation, not actually approve a landmark designation today. And after we make our decision, either way, it goes to, I think, either, I think city council is next um, to. City planning commission. Planning, yep, yeah, planning then, then city council. So we are, are simply, uh, we'll be voting today on whether or not to recommend a uh, landmark designation for the property. Uh, Mr. Owen, I, I'll ask that maybe you uh, elaborate just a little bit. I, I guess my understanding of the split um, of excluding part of the property from the uh, landmark boundary it would not prohibit for instance, you know, parking for the, the, the landmarked property to be developed on that site or, or supporting uh, infrastructure or, or buildings. I, I read it as indicating that the um, excluding that portion of the site from the landmark boundary was actually a, a, an attempt to provide more flexibility for that portion of the site. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit? Right. Yes, that is correct. It's to provide that flexibility for the new development along the Woodburn Street frontage. Um, parking 
would not necessarily be prohibited from being developed within the boundaries. It is handled in the in the proposed conservation guidelines by by saying that uh, parking should be designed so as not to distract from the visual quality of the building and screening should be sufficient to minimize the view of park vehicles from the other properties, the street and other public areas. So parking the way that the guidelines are proposed can be developed within the boundaries, whether that's the smaller boundary proposed by staff or the full site proposed by the applicant. Are there other questions or comments from the board? Mr. Ross? Yeah, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I, I, I think I understand the purpose of uh, a paragraph in the recommendation, but I am not supportive of it at this point. Um, I understand B and C, those make sense to me. So Madam Chair, I, I, first of all, I'd like to address the, why are we paying attention to it now? Uh, I think we're paying attention to it now because somebody's proposed tearing down a building which clearly meet criteria one and three. Doesn't mean it can't come down, as Mr. Zalasco said, that if there's a economic argument, that's, that's the next step down the path. But for right now, somebody's proposed tearing down a building which it does meet criteria one and three, and I, I don't think anybody can really effectively argue that. So I move that we recommend to the city, Cincinnati City Planning Commission and to the city city council uh, for the designation of the portion uh, of the tax parcels as listed here, or also known as 30, 3060 Durrell Avenue, known as the Hoffman School as a historic landmark and adoption of the related Hoffman School uh, conservation guidelines subject to the following conditions. B, prior to appearing before the city planning commission, the conservation guidelines shall be amended to remove reference to new construction of the athletic field along Woodburn Avenue. C, any construction proposed with the proposed landmark boundary shall comply with the proposed historic conservation guidelines. And finally, that we approve the submission of a letter of support to the Ohio Historic Site Preservation Advisory Board for any potential future national registrar nomination. I would note that I'm specifically eliminating paragraph A from the recommendation. I would second that. Okay, uh, we have a motion and a second. I will call the roll. Mr. Weiss? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, aye. Mr. Thunderman? Aye. Mr. Young? Aye. Mr. Zelasco? Aye. Mr. Voss? Aye. Uh, the chair votes aye. Okay, so the recommendation to uh, uh, for landmark status is passed on to planning and city council. Are there any other items on the agenda that we need to get through today? No. Then I will entertain a motion on adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.